and here the speaker as well, or you should be. Um, so without much further delay, we already are running a bit late in time. So we are going to have the second tutorial session in fire. Uh, and this is going to be on data centric AI and it's going to be delivered by the budget Paul of Amazon. Right. So without much further delay, let me hand it over to the budget. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope I am audible. I hope uh, everyone can hear me on in. Maybe just speak up a bit. So it will be here. Can you hear me? You can't? Can it will be better if you just speak louder. Yes. Okay. Uh, or you can also come forward. Same thing applies. Okay. Uh, I'll try to speak uh, louder. Uh, but I hope uh, online people can uh, hear me. Uh, so I'll be talking about something which is called uh, data centric AI. I think uh, it got popularity. Uh, I don't. I think there. Are, I think work has been going on for a couple of years now, and I think uh, it got popularity from Andrew Ng. And some of my slides are shamelessly copy pasted from him uh, because um, I couldn't find better slides. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think uh, so. I think this is something which I worked uh, a lot in this year. And uh, I wanted to kind of discuss some of the ideas. I think still a lot of things are not very uh, concrete in, uh, in terms of what is data centric AI and how it is different from the other parts of uh, machine learning and AI that we are talking about. But uh, I, I'll be talking more, more on the context of NLP. Uh, and some of my examples will be also from NLP. Uh, so I think uh, I, I'll take an example of something which I which which is not part of uh, which is not under NDA basically I can't talk about the things that I worked on uh, but uh, it, it is a representation it it would be a good representation of what I was uh, doing or or a subset of what I was doing and how this entire uh, kind of uh, data centric thing uh, came into uh, my work. Uh, so. Uh, we were dealing with uh, like this this kind of a simple data uh, depression detection from text problem. Uh, so, which is like if you have a text, how can you detect whether people are depressed or not depressed or mighty mighty depressed? And there are some popular data sets uh, from Reddit uh, on which you can detect it. Uh, so, uh, the thing that we did was like we looked at uh, BERT because. I think the state of the art on depression detection is something based on mental bird. So you are, you are exploring bird for this problem. Uh, but you can treat this as any classification problem that we see in NLP and, uh, and you are trying to use a transformer based model or any kind of kind of model to uh, classify that text. And uh, the data set was, I mean, the, I mean, mental bird kind of, uh, kind of, I think uh, is close to 80, seven or 88 percent on on the benchmark data they used which is by the way not public uh you need to sign a, a different kinds of uh, contract to kind of get the data or different kinds of agree i mean this uh nds to basically get the data uh but uh this is this is more open source i think this was this is a part of a student research uh, of uh, acl that we we're exploring is it a uh, like problem? this is not any r problem this is basically a classification problem so you are given ready text. No, you don't need to. So there's no text span here. So it's just like saying that is the post related to depression or not. But uh, I mean, it's not about the problem, but I think in some of the cases we, we have seen that the base model for this data set actually, like although like in the in the benchmark that mental bird proposes, there is like some 80, 90 percent. Uh, I think uh, F1 score, but I think here we are getting very low. I think I think uh, what we are getting is close to 57 percent, uh, 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 like uh, precision and 61 percent recall. After finding uh, mental word, this is just using simple word. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, mental word I think is even even lower. So I mean, uh, and and the thing is that we try to use line and all these things to kind of explain why this is uh, what kind of thing it is trying and and of course like by the classified performance I don't think any kind of explainable AI will work because you have to have a good classifier to uh, have good explanation. Uh, so 
we did a lot of kind of so i was working with a lot of psychologists on this so actually like they pointed out very traditional uh, research in in uh, psychiatry we talk which like or psychology talks about like uh, if you look at uh, people who are depressed they tend to use words which are more self focused like i am my and uh, there will be like this kind of depression related words like awful lonely so these are some of the indicators in the data so uh, if you are looking for explanation there should be good correlation with this kind of uh, words in your word or in your attention but interestingly the paper that uh, proposed or the bench i mean the the base paper which proposed it was at uh, got uh, uh, around uh, i think uh, 70% precision uh, using very simple techniques and and basically like they they use i think some data augmentation to move it to 70% uh, which i mean they were getting close to 60% but the data augmentation itself seems to push the precision up to 70% which is kind of bad uh because usually we don't get that much lift with they just data augmentation so what do you mean what techniques you use for data so they actually it is not this by the base paper they actually use some sort of uh, uh like uh, this smart smart for doing this which which i'm which i'm dead against uh, for doing <laughs> this because uh because like the assumption you are making is quite bad there uh, because you are saying that okay i'm i'm going to use a knn and now there are open question about okay what is the similarity you are using Uh, what is your k and all these things and uh, and you can you can do whatever you want but those kind of things basically doesn't uh, really works in practice uh yeah so uh we tried using gpt2 but uh, and also like uh, things like convert uh nothing really worked and uh, so uh, basically like i was working with one of the one, one of uh, a, a basically online psychology firm who is trying to crack this problem but uh yeah so basically like uh we we couldn't be, be, beat the benchmark uh and and basically like then we took some samples and also look, uh, you know gave it to psychologists to kind of uh, to basically label them uh saying that okay can you can you go and label this from rated uh so this one one thing that usually like you do is that if you uh, if you're not getting good performance then you can also try to get more labeled data uh this is usually what we go to that you have you have some data and now we can go and get more data uh ideally like whenever we we encounter some low accuracy we kind of see we kind of do two things one is like we get gather more data or we try a better model that that is the two two approaches that we usually take uh but i think something something uh, is was wrong in this case which which was which i mean both of this didn't solve the problem and uh, yeah i think uh, so basically like i think the thing that we miss missed here was trying to evaluate the data itself saying that whatever data we have does the data itself make sense whether there was uh, whether whether that data itself is good enough to be modeled or not and uh, i think this this is a recurring problem in any industry or in any kind of uh, uh, machine learning uh, research as well that we usually like take a data set and we try to model on it but we don't kind of go back and check how good the data set is or whether we can improve the data set by improving the labels or other data quality and i think that that is going to be the focus for this at uh, core uh so i think uh, the the key is that uh, so there is no generic measure of quality but i think if you look at uh, you know european commission different kinds of european uh, authorities have been specifically pointing out data bias uh, i think for some time now and uh, and how how you know you can exploit those data bias for doing uh, a lot of things for example like there were uh, i think recently concerned about giving out loans based on gender and things like that or, or you know your race or race basically uh and i think this is something which uh, i think i don't know like how many of the researchers agree but i think uh, the researchers also have to do a lot of this that uh, in industry at least 80% of the time you would be doing some sort of uh, data cleaning or transforming the data um but i think i think the rest is lesser uh, but uh, most of the time goes in analyzing and kind of just cleaning the data uh in research i think it is a bit lower because 
most of the benchmark data set already you know what kind of training you need to do but still i think the same problem does applies so uh and i think this this where uh uh kind of uh uh andrew ng kind of came in and say that okay uh i mean so uh that if you if you look at some of this uh you know problems that that are there that for example like suppose there is this kind of still sheet defect kind of a detection problem and you have a uh, baseline accuracy of 76% and your company wants you to make it like 90%. Uh, now, usually like if you pose this question to, uh, you know, uh, you know, data scientists saying that, what do you want to do? Should you improve the model or, or the data? So uh, it seems that, you know, people want to improve their data. Uh, and and you can improve your data by collecting more data or by labeling or by kind of in, investigating whether the same data makes sense. And uh, usually this is very interesting in the sense that if I have a baseline uh, model and uh, now I I have uh, and I have some uh, uh, like improved version of model. For example, maybe I'm using uh, you know simple uh, CNN and then I use some VGG or something. Maybe it will improve, but it will not improve significantly. But if we go and improve the data, then uh, sometimes we get very significant. Data. For example, sixteen percent improvement just by on the still uh, defect detection problem. So sometimes we miss this kind of improvement uh, because we don't look at the data and say that okay, what we can, uh, what we can do. About it. And uh, I think that is kind of something which we need to kind of look at. I I don't know what are the ways in which we should look at, but I mean it's it's very much problem specific and application specific but definitely like we have to start a discussion right now otherwise like we'll be you know forever like kind of beating uh, like kind of beat around the bush and try to improve the model without kind of getting uh, visibility on the data so uh yeah i think this is this is something which is very interesting right so uh if you look at i think this from new uh, new rips that uh, 99 percent of the papers in new rips are uh related to some uh like AI um, or model model research, basically, uh, and only one percent you spent on uh, on on data 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 kind of uh, improving the data quality or improving how to improve the labeling and things like that. There are there are, there has been an increasing number of papers recently, but this is a statistic from a couple of years back. Uh, but if you look at the eighty percent of the time we in industry we do spend like in, in preparing or transforming or creating data pipeline, so we should spend like some more amount of research I mean, in a proportional manner to improve that policy. And, and I think a large amount of industry today, uh, especially like computer vision and NLP, which deals with unstructured text, uh, have this problem. Because if you look at information retrieval, uh, yeah, you, you can get a lot of data from clicks uh, or from uh, purchase. But at the end of the day, to measure relevance, you need some uh, some labelers to come and say, yeah, this is this is kind of more relevant than this. Uh, clicks and and kind of in purchases might not be always the best source of uh, feedback because th those suffers from other kind of biases we'll talk about. So mm -hmm. uh, so any kind of this uh, systems requires a labeling approach, and I think uh, we currently you know bank on a lot of you know one thing that we bank on saying that okay, uh, whatever levels a human auditor gives is great, but I think that's not the case always uh, so so i think uh, this is what usually we do in a in a ml project we you kind of find what is the scope of your project you collect the data you train your model and then you uh, deploy in production uh, yeah in, in most of the research you you might want you, you you don't really need a production deployment but it 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 kind of uh, requires you to deep dive into the model or do some kind of uh, post hoc analysis on the model, so which you can treat as a uh, like after what, what we usually do train after training the model or trying to explain why why your model is working. Uh, so this is kind of a ML life cycle, and uh, if you uh, think about like a simple like a problem like speech recognition where uh, you define like like you have certain uh, data for uh, recognizing voice. And uh, then you go and collect the data. Then uh, you train the speech recognition model, and then then basically like you uh, do some analysis on its performance. So uh, 
now i think the the thing that we uh, we do in this define and collect data is kind of one is that there is a labeling part that happens so that i mean either you might have your data already labeled or it might be that uh, that you you are in a process of labeling your data from various sources you can also scrape data from the internet or from other other sources and uh, one thing that i think we we don't usually check is how consistent is our labeling uh for example like uh, uh, if someone is in um, right in, in in front of like while saying today's weather then all these things fits into the same label uh or, or should you want, should you want to differentiate that uh, that something is is should be within the scope of this uh, collect and define your data but usually we don't look at this labeling part we do a lot of data analysis but i don't think we look at uh, whether uh, the labels are consistent or not and I, I don't think there is a there is a very concrete way of finding uh, label consistency uh, in in most of the scenarios. Uh, if you have annotators, human annotators, you can do it very easily, but it is very expensive. I mean, for human annotators, what you can do is that you can keep uh, multiple annotators for the same example and see how many of them mismatch. It's a it's a very old technique, but uh, it's very expensive. For example, like if you are trying uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, you will basically need five x the cost if you need uh, five kind of uh, uh, like five labelers per per sample. And there is another interesting thing that happens in this kind of labeling is that the amount you are paying to your labelers is also going to determine the quality of your labels, right? So most of the time we want to you know say that we will get more label data, so we will uh, <laughs> we will increase the per sample uh, cost. And we have uh, we have done this a lot. So I can for sure tell you that uh, that actually, you know, uh, uh, deteriorates your quality of the data. And I think that, that is related to uh, how how is it how is it that we decide that how many labelers do we need? I mean, given a task, is there any guideline so as to say that okay, so this requires three labelers, so this requires five labelers because it's more subjective? Is there any guideline behind that process? There are two parts to it. One is like uh, one is who are your labelers? Like there are there are different kinds of. Let's assume the labelers are all like very knowledgeable in the field, and domain experts, right? Yeah. So there, there can be domain experts. There can be just general people, right? Yeah. So general people we don't trust. So right. maybe you know, yeah. we need more. Right. That's not that's not controllable process. Right. So let's assume the process is controllable. Right. So, so I, being a manager, I want to figure out that okay. So I have this task in my hand. Right. Now I want to remind. I want to optimize the call. I don't want to spend mm -hmm. money on my labelers for a task that requires only one label mm -hmm. because the task is objective. So I don't want to spend money. Why do you decide whether the task is objective or subjective? So what should be the guidelines for that process? So uh, one is like, who is setting up the guideline? So one is like you set up your guideline itself. So when you set up the guideline, you kind of see whether you can concretely uh, write out the guidelines in a very small font. If you can't, then then it's a very complex problem that you're dealing with. No, no, I'm not talking about the guideline itself, but I'm talking about yeah. what should be my strategy. Behind right. So, so, so basically, like let, let's let's say what are the constraints, right? The one one constraint is budget, right? If you have infinite budget, you will you know allocate as many people you can. Then you can get more data and you can also see what is your variance of the sample or, okay. or the labels, okay. right? So one constraint is obviously budget, right? So you have uh you have certain budget and you want to uh so and and also like there, there are the other two uh, you know uh parameters are what is the so how many samples you want that is another usually like okay. some of the business will have that i need five thousand samples okay. like uh or at least a thousand samples so then 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 one thing gets uh and then then basically like how many labelers you can accommodate gets guided by the budget okay right but ideally, what I have seen is that you should at least have three, and in okay. in 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 the best case, you should have five at least. Uh, yeah, not yeah. Is there a specific reason for going for not number? Yeah, because uh, there can be you know this. Uh, I mean, the same reason why we go for odd k in k uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's no, I think I think it's a good point. Actually, like you can actually. You can also play with it. You can actually keep an even number and see if there is a tie. Because if there is a tie, uh, but the thing is like, if you have a tie, the point is like, do you want to revisit the problem? Because it will just keep on increasing your cost. So, uh, and you also mentioned about, so if you go back to the last slide, the previous slide, 
so I think you were mentioning that, okay, so there is this model centric approach where I can aim to improve my model, but that doesn't help that much because you know you might increase the complexity of your model, but that doesn't lead to a very high improvement of accuracy, right? So that's one perspective, which tells us that, okay, so maybe increasing model complexity is not something you want, but you want to have more labeled data, right? So that gives the chance for even simpler models to perform quite well on right. a task, right? But these are like two different extremes of the problem, right? So one, you look at the model itself, one, look at the data, but somewhere down the line, you are forgetting about the features, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't need to be solely working with data. I mean, that's something that we can do if we don't want to annotate the features, mm -hmm. but that's something that we can. I mean, if we are talking about increasing or having more labels for the data, we can even think about, let's say, you know, we don't want 10,000 samples to be labeled, mm -hmm. but we want 1,000 data instances to be featured. Analyzed, right? So we put the features, okay, so for the steel detection problem, right? So we can put in examples like these are the features that if present in the data could indicate this, right? So try to find features that are highly correlated with the labels that we want to predict. So why don't people talk about that intermediate step nowadays? I mean, why they do not talk about only about the model and about the data and not about features anymore? Because they can have ensemble models, right? Like I think for some of this, some of the problems are uh, like entirely like unstructured data. So mm -hmm. detecting mm -hmm. features has its own perils because uh, if you're talking about annotating ten thousand samples, you're prepared to put effort into the data annotation process, right? But maybe you don't need to annotate ten thousand samples, but you could have like a small subset of features being annotated for hundred instances. Like that's still doable if in, in terms of effort. That's comparable to labeling 10,000 samples. No, but features won't help you to generalize, right? I mean, if you have these features. But a particular task, it might. Why not? Yeah, but. We are talking about steel detection. We are not talking about a general AI system that can solve everything. Mm -hmm. So there are two problems with, with going by the feature approach. One is like you are uh, always bounded by your own imagination of what features can be. Uh, so I think that is the biggest task. We also data, right? I mean, if you're annotating and then we are relying on the domain experts of annotators, right? Right. So, but the, the question is like, so even if you don't understand, so it, it, it's kind of thinking about this, right? So, uh, you always don't understand your decision process, mm -hmm. but uh, a human annotator is, so basically like you are assuming here that a human is very good at the, in, the, in this task, mm -hmm. right? So if you if you so it can be like if, if you think about go, going to an ex, ex, ex expert and saying that or I don't know what they're called actually, actually like but when they're diagnosing right so if you ask them why you are doing that it might be because of years of training they have right. gone some and 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 they might be very not very much vigilant about the decision process yeah. so uh, I think we have seen this a lot that when you ask them why. Uh, sometimes uh, they are doing it very intuitively, uh, and and I, I I'll talk about that. And you know, there is a lot of problem because of that, because uh, cognitive bias and all this kind of bias is in. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you want to bank on that expertise that a human has, uh, and uh, who can take a decision without really being cognizant about all the features that it is banking its decision on. So I think that that is the main reason of not going for features. I have a on perspective yeah. on that, right? So since we are moving towards uh, bird-based models, mm -hmm. so we are moving away from features now. It is right, like we are just. No, that I agree. But yeah. that right? What's stopping you from it now? To solve the problem, you, you you don't really need to use a transformer. Right. So basically, the question is, if you want to really solve the problem, why can't we just use the set of features? And yeah, you know, you know, you know, you could have the features injected into the higher layers of the network, right? So your lower networks is dealing solely with the data. It's building, it's abstracting out some features like convolutions or whatever. And then you have like a dense vector, but you could concatenate the features into the dense vector and then have another dense layer on top of that. And you can have this end to end training. Right? So data plus features is something that you can have in your model. Yeah. It seems like people, they either go for the data or for the model, but they sometimes forget that there are steps in it. And this but I think we, as a, nice yeah. that you know, if you have if you inject features into your data model, it actually helps. 
No, it definitely helps. Uh, but the question is like, it is very hard to evaluate that process, even harder than data. Yeah. But to do that process, right? I mean, yeah, do so that. Evaluate that. Yeah, I think uh, I think this is one example, like how your de labeling discrepancies can happen. For example, like you have kind of uh, iguanas, right? So and and people can I think annotate. So this is one problem where you you have bad instruction. Basically, you have not said that label each of them or uh, label all of them together. I mean, you are not given that instruction. And uh, this is a very common problem that uh, the instructions are not very clear. And sometimes it's because the instruction might be very hard. I mean, it's just like, uh, I mean, for this kind of image-based thing, it's it's easy. But suppose you are saying that, you know, detect uh, racial slur or something like, which is toxic. This is very much subjective. And, and you can't really kind of write out an instruction saying that this is what is toxic, this is what is not toxic. So, uh, and, and that's, that's one, you know, very popular data set called jigsaw toxic comments. I think there you can see all these biases. Uh, so yeah, I think the, the the easier way for this kind of thing is what we were, uh, what I was saying that ask you know independent levelers, uh, not maybe two, maybe three or five, and see uh, whether uh, there is consistency within their labeling. And if there is not, they're not consistent. You can just go and revisit the problems. But uh, usually, doing this process is very very expensive, and and it's not really. I mean, if you want to re really solve solve it, you might want to spend a lot of money on on just labeling. That that's one problem. Uh, so similarly, like this, like you, you really don't know what kind of, uh, so you can actually like, what you can do is that sometimes you can actually like take the labels and, and do an intersection of them and, and, and make better labels. So you can uh, post process the labels. Uh, so for example, like here, if you just take an intersection of the two labels, you get uh, the two labels to just agree. Um, similarly, in the first case, but these are slightly difficult to do in all case, all, all scenarios. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for images, it, it's slightly easier. Um, so I think uh, I think what we are trying to do is like you know, one is like go and you know keep your data fixed and then iterate on the model, or you can go to the other side and say that okay, I'll. I'll uh, keep my model fixed and then improve my data and see whether improving the data improves the model performance, giving the model. Set. So one is the model centric view, which is uh, improving the models and the data centric view is just you know, uh, looking at uh, the code and, and trying to improve your data. So, and I really want, uh, want a combination of this. So, uh, so usually like this, another bias, I think most of the people have while doing machine learning is that you need a lot of samples because uh, which is which is not true in all the cases, right? You, you don't really I think what they was they were saying is that instead of like having too many samples, you're gonna have low quality. I mean, less number of good quality samples. And I think that that is kind of something which reflects if you see that if you have small data but you have noisy labels and versus small and clean data set, you'll you'll get much better fit. Uh, whereas if you have a big data but there is not, not very good data. It still not perform very well uh, because uh, the labels are not uh, good or your data quality might not be good. And uh, that leads to all sorts of uh, problems. So uh, you can you should focus on like small, uh, like they get, getting as much clean data as possible. Not really. So basically like it's, if you have multiple labelers, uh, like if you have 10, like suppose like you want to get 10,000 samples, uh, you have the budget for that. You can you can choose like uh, two thousand samples by assigning same data to five different labels, and and that way, or you can have three thousand samples by uh, giving three three samples to each label, same labels, right? And see, so th that way you, you'll get much more better confidence. But how does it work in seek to seek kind of problems? You work on summarization kind of task, right? So you give a news article and you want to summarize, so different people will write different types. No, that is there, right? So that that will. So in some of the problems, you want the subjective is there. Right? So summarization and 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 you know generation uh, any kind of text generation problem, there is subjectivity. Even even in situation like as I said that toxic or you know hate speech, you will see there is subjectivity. You not everyone thinks something is hate, right? So uh, yeah, I think 
getting that subjectivity out might not be the first task that yeah. Inter annotator agreement, whatever you are talking about, if you take three different mm -hmm. annotators also, mm -hmm. different people might give different outputs, and we cannot validate whether we, uh, they all agree because they might use different words, but they mean the same. Act. Right. So you, you can see the similarity in the, those cases, like how similar similar they are. So, of course, they will not match, you know, uh, apples to apples, mm -hmm. but you can use uh, some sign of similarity, whether they are similar or not. You can keep threshold. Uh, you can look at there are lots of ways to do so. So I mean, you can see you know overlap of uh, uh, entities, whether the, you know they're talking about the same entities or whether they have the same sentiment. What are the you know different pause tags around it? You, you can do those kind of analysis. But of course, like it is very much sent, say, you know application centric. What do you want to achieve? And it's not very clear how do you go and check those, like how. How exactly the sum they, they should overlap. Uh, so and the same problem comes in data augmentation. When you're augmenting the data, you don't know what, what the target distribution of your augmentation should be. Should it match same as your training data, uh, base data, or it should be something else? Uh, so yeah. So I think those are the things, open question I think we have, which is still not answered. So uh yeah, I think uh, so. The, the takeaway from here is that if you have more clean data, it's always to have more and more clean data than having uh, big data with with which are which are noisy. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, if you look at the number of training samples with the, the increase in accuracy with number of training samples, you can see that with clean data you can get the same accuracy uh, as you are getting with even like. 1500 sample, you can get the same accuracy with 500 samples uh, or, or lower than that. Actually. So, uh, so that, that, that's, that's the, you know, take away. So I think uh, it's a well-known kind of a thing that uh, you don't really need big data, but you need good data. Uh, so what's the systematic way of doing this? I mean, is there like active learning strategies? Is there a formal way of telling me uh, so this is the subset that I should be using for training my models, or these are the instances that I should consider for labeling. Can active learning strategies be helpful in industry? Active learning strategies are, are, I think, the most used in this kind of scenarios. Is it used in? Yeah, it is. It is, I think, the most go-to thing that you want you go for because. So I think there is one one comment by you know Karpathy, which is uh, which which is like kind of followed in industry a lot, which is like saying that. So uh, you start with the data and then, then you figure out you, you have a base model. And uh, that is not your final model because that model kind of gives you a way to analyze your data as well. So you can look at uh, the prediction of that model and you can look at some of the hard negatives or uh, you know, uh, some of the false positives. And uh, you can do active learning based on that. So the active learning is just like you, know, you selectively sample so basically, like you can say that okay, I, I'll take uh, I'll take samples which has which my model has say ninety percent confident of say being depressed here yeah? uh, for the for the example that I was considering uh, that uh, and then you found out that the actual level was not depressed. So you you kind of consider only those and uh, try to relabel them or try to uh, retrain your model based on that. Uh, so you can you can use those kind of uh, uh, Scenarios. No, but in active learning, you don't know the labels of the unannotated instances, right? So you start with a small seed set of the label data. Right. And you can only work with that. And only working with that, you need to predict how likely is it or how beneficial <laughs> oh, no, not test it, yeah. to annotate that particular instance. But you don't know the label of that. And you, you don't know. You don't know. Yeah. So basically, you, you sort by the uh, you know model out probability, yes, like decreasing. Is that, is that a reasonable thing to do in a realistic situation? That's what I want to know. Because yeah, the model yeah. could be, you know, if the data to start with was noisy, the model is noisy. No, so, so, so one, one of the strategies that you can use is that you can you can sort by the, so you can take, say, the class where you are, you're confident that it is depressed or you're confident it is not depressed. And uh, then what you can do is that then you can. What is you here, the model or me? The model. The model. But as I'm saying, I mean, if the data to start with was noisy itself, so, then the model initially is noisy. And then relying on the noisy outcome or estimation from a model, and then deciding 
based on that factor could add more noise to the data, right? No, you can, you can, you, so basically like active, active learning is like where uh, you can also like choose to relabel. So, so basically what you relabel, so you can either randomly relabel stuff or you can get more data, but you can say that, okay, I, I'll get, get my label. So the way to evaluate is that you will get the labels where you have very high pro high confidence okay. from the model, and then you go and choose to relabel them. Right. So in that way, you can actually like uh, get more confidence in which direction. Right. But do you think it should be the other way around, right? So when the model no. is no, not very confident, can we take them? You can also do that. You can also do that. But that doesn't tell you whether your model is good or not, or whether your base data is good or not. Like, no, but the active learning advantage is like you want to improve the model, like you want to select which data set to be labeled, right? right. Like yes. when the model is not confident on yes, some data. It's, it's called uncertainty yeah. sampling. So where the model is most uncertain. Yeah, we can take that. And take those points. So you can take those, yeah. So uh, but I mean there are multiple ways of doing it. You can you can also get things which the model is confused. Mm -hmm. But the question was like if you're starting it is noisy, right? Uh, how do you know that your model is uncertain on those or it's just because you're noisy labels right in those cases i think the model score is not very reliable so you, you might want to do multiple parts of it first you go and check okay uh, let me take where my model is most confident and see what those are and now if you get a good agreement basically it will reinforce your model and now you you are at a much good position to look at things which are where your model are not confident and now label them right so I think that that is a usual way that people follow. Yeah, I think the, the I think that that is the way usually like we also improve the data that you kind of train a model and do some error analysis and, and see where the model is either poorly performing or uh, you know you you have or, or if you if your initial set is noisy then you can uh, also look at uh, cases like this where you can take the model where the model is most confident on and then try to relabel them and then uh, then try to feed them back to the model and then see uh, right so you can either uh, uh, use augmentation or generation or data collection so uh, the data collection part is more expensive but better in some sense than augmentation and generation because in augmentation you are again making a lot of assumptions uh, in generation also you are making a lot of assumptions uh, Yeah, so I think the, the idea is that, you know, so uh, in, in, in earlier, like we, we don't have, we didn't have this kind of uh, quality checks on the data uh, in, 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 a, in a pipeline like this. You only check the model metrics, but I think you need to look for this kind of systemic drift. So in, in most of the industry uh, scenarios, you do check for drift in, uh, in different kind of features that happen. And, uh, and then you kind of try to, uh, uh, you know, iterate on that. For example, like one of the things that is done uh, is that uh, you usually do a lot of explore exploit scenarios just to take care of uh, like system. I think in recommendation, if you see that uh, in recommendation, the problem is that if you have a movies, which is I think seen a lot, you have a lot of data on that. And then new coming movies will not have a lot of data. And it will obviously bias for, uh, you know, movies which are popular. And uh, then you might want to do some, you know, explore expert scenario where you randomly choose from a set of uh, new movies. And then you try to see how that, that is performing. And then you try to collect more data. And uh, that can help you to understand whether there is a drift uh, or a data drift or even like uh, your model drift because of that. So that is basically the way you update the data. The how do you identify data. drift in like classification problems? Like say you have some tasks uh, like here you get a news and you tag uh, some financial label mm -hmm. and it is in production mm -hmm. so how do you identify that this is yeah i think there are two ways one is like first, first is like you you track metrics for your features for example like you can check your engrams for labels or uh, different categories of engrams and their distributions so for example, like suppose you are suddenly seeing a lot of new jargons coming to your data. That, that, that's not a good good sign basically because your model is not habitual or is not trained on those basically. 
whether it is because of the data or it's because of the model. So th those are in the key takeaways uh, from uh, from this, right? Uh, so, so I think uh, the interesting thing is that in, in industry, whatever I've seen is that you you actually like really need help from domain experts uh, to solve some problems. Uh, not not all of them, but some of them are really really domain expert. So uh, sometimes like you need to sit with the linguist and see what kind of uh, what is the reason basically what they were, they were saying that what is the reason they have labeled it in certain ways and, and then try to work backwards from that. Uh, so yeah, I think the key takeaway is that, you know, you need to kind of focus more on data uh, along with your model and, uh, and and kind of try to come with systemic approach, at least like even though there is no very well-defined approach right now, but for your problem, you can come up with systemic approach to deal with data quality. Uh, <laughs> so I think the, the interesting thing that we observed in our case is that uh, a lot of uh, human experts, uh, like they, they had like around 60% of the labels actually were flipping uh, across psychologists for this depression detection problem. So when he gave it to psychologists, uh, it kind of just flipped and, uh, and, and, and it might be because in, in this case, it's very difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem where you're looking at a text and trying to detect what is depression and what is not depression. Uh, that is a very difficult task for a lot of psychologists to do because they say that, okay, I don't have a lot of input and they might be just labeling things as uh, not depressed or mildly depressed or something like that just, just for, uh, for the sake of labeling. So uh, the instruction part, I think is very, very important uh, that how do you craft your instruction because uh, if the instruction are not correct, then I think uh, it, it becomes uh, very difficult. And especially like when you're using uh, things like Amazon, Amazon Mechanical Turk or, or things like that, where you, you can label the data, but the people are not really subject matter experts and you are giving some instruction, they're doing it uh, based on this instruction. Uh, you might have bad quality levels uh, if you don't write uh, you know, good instruction. And if you write, write long instruction, people don't read. That, that's another point. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the solution is that I already said that you have, you know, more, uh, more expert. There's a lag. Okay. Yeah, there's a lag. I'm connected, but I think there's a lag here. I can't see the slide. I mean, the same slide. Yeah, I think this. So I think uh, <laughs> so you can you can get a better human expert, and 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 like usually like getting five experts might uh, make your cost five x. Uh, so sometimes like data quality. I mean, it's not always a label problem, but data quality can be another uh, big issue. You might not have good quality data as well incorrect feature values. A lot of people like do uh, EDA and just impute features. Uh, and, and we do it sometimes blindly without without like having a lot of context. And, and I think those are also very uh, key factors. Uh, how, what do you assume while you, know, you, are, you are imputing your data? So I think that the, the, the major challenges that I've seen in, in industry setup is that, so usually like whatever we see in our, uh, you know, uh, in, in most of the cases in, in, in research or uh, uh, that usually we have all these things already set up. You already have the data in, in some, you know, good format, but usually industry will get uh, data continuously fed from some sources. And there will be a lot of joins that happens with multiple tables and you will be joining 
and a data bug can happen at any point in time and uh, you will only see the reflection of that in, in at the model output uh, and then it can happen because you will be using historical data it you might detect that problem maybe you know a month down the line and then it's very painful to see where exactly it went wrong uh, so yeah th this is this is more like an engineering challenge but I, I, i'm sure like there will be a ml solution to this as well where you kind of detect uh, how how to figure out that there is a data bug i mean you, you can actually like build uh, build outlier detection to kind of figure out uh, where uh, some of the i think libraries actually do, does that where you can figure out uh, outlier data and just remove it it is more like on the outlier detection problem uh, but the, the same problem appears that you don't know whether it's an outlier or a future feature because it might be just new new kind of a data so so if we have a model like erosot extraction kind of thing uh, it is in production now but when the model is actually training to produce the data output how will you, how will you figure out you don't have any level data new data is coming you don't have any level no but yeah i think so so this you're not training the model right so you're just you're just you have a model and basically like you are giving so for example you are using gpt3 right there there's no you are not training the model you are giving some text and you want it to output some text right and you so the the the, the question is that that three three kind of variables here right one is that what input you are giving to the model that might be buggy right if that is not buggy then uh, the model might be you know a problematic uh, because gpt3 has uh, so so if you are using gpt3 you don't have a you know way to retrain it but suppose you are using your own own kind of version of gpt3 then you can go and retrain so those you can take the down as samples which are which are erroneous and then you can uh, iterate on that right so in that case the problem of uh, data error kind of can be ruled out right because you only have your prompt and you are giving that input to the prompt as long as you are confident that that input is not is correct then it's a model problem right so, it cannot be it cannot be something else so Maybe you have trained some model. Any model you take. Yeah. So, so the if if your input is correct, right? So if, if the input no, when new data is coming, we don't know whether the input is correct or not. That kind of. Yeah. So so that's what I'm saying. That you have to either investigate that input data or you have to investigate <laughs> the model. So uh, and and you have to do both basically. Right. So you can you can you can do you know. So what you can do is that you can. take the input data and you can find figure out a knn on top of it and see what are similar samples so yeah those kind of things are more you know you have to do go and do it on hands i don't think there is a system so in which so the quality of data is not good do you mean that they are adversarial samples by any way yes there can be adversarial samples there can be buggy samples i mean buggy. buggy means like your feature is something which is not possible in suppose you have you know transaction value negative okay. right that is out of the norm your model will then there should be simple rules to check buggy Right. Yeah, sometimes that is, that is not that obvious, right? For example, like you might have people just hundred years old, okay. which is like difficult to check. But then there is a host of lot of literature on adversarial training, which kind of expects. But I mean, speaking for the ones which is not easy to detect, mm -hmm. there are a whole lot of literature on providing defense against the models for this kind of active, this kind of adversarial learning. Right. So that that that's yeah, that, that's that's a model centric approach. Right? You, you kind of yes. improve the model like this, like. you can also improve the you know quality of the data and then you can automatically get right so i'm saying that if you have a so it's very much like in like uh, application specific how do you improve the quality of the data like uh, but you can uh, you can improve the data right i mean you are saying that your data is buggy so uh, if you have a scope to improve your data you can do it. sorry i just continuation with the question right so i think uh, i have a model in production right so which takes as uh, speech uh, and identify the speaker okay mm -hmm. so what we do is we get the training data and someone manually labels correct it basically all that so we retrain the model every week mm -hmm. so the current setup is we get the uh, last seven days data so we combine it to the old data and then train a model i mean we keep like 10% as test data before deploying it like because we want to test whether the model is correct or not mm -hmm. like 5% we take from the data and mm -hmm. evaluate on 5% and if it's greater than 80% then we deploy it in production mm -hmm. 
So is that the correct way to do or should we directly push it into production like without saying? Definitely even... not directly. Okay. Is that the correct way or is it? Yeah, you should way? have some evaluation before pushing. So that, that is also not the best way because ideally you should also do some kind of experimentation like A-B testing uh, before you push it. Any kind of software ch changes go with A-B testing. Uh, right. But here it's say, for internal stakeholders, right? So we have. Some... Yeah, I mean, if you don't have something which is like external, like you have a control on what what people are going to give as input, then it's fine. Uh, yeah, but yeah, of course you have to evaluate on on unseen set before you push them. So, but A/B testing again, you go into production and then do the A/B testing, right? So. Yeah, but you don't go fully into production, mm -hmm. right? You have some control on how much you. Go into production. So. Yeah, but you can see, like, you know, so basically, like you're saying that, okay, so what can happen is that maybe your your baseline model was trained on some, you know, older data, and the new model is trained on some recent data, right? So you're not doing apples to apples comparison when you are saying that, right? So, uh, so ideally, it should be applied to the same kind of uh, in output and, you know, see. You know, what we do is we collect the data, mm -hmm. last seven days data, and combine it to the entire data, and take 5% of this entire data again, mm -hmm. and then train it on 95 and test it on 5%. Right. And if it's greater than 80%, then only we do it. Yeah, but I mean, so uh, you can also check what is what, what is the performance with respect to the last model, right? Yeah. Right, so. But the problem is there will be new speakers that might come up in the last seven yeah, days. Come, yeah, so, yeah no, but but yeah, that, but it, it, might be, it might be deteriorating for things which are not there. Right? Mm -hmm. And they might again come, right? So, uh, yeah, so I think so. Of course, like you need to kind of evaluate on unseen set before doing it. Yeah, so that is like much short. So I think uh, what is it? Time? Should we take a break? Five minutes. And then yeah. So let's take a break and then come back. And if we somehow apply some things to like
So uh, I think we will start. We'll talk about uh, bias in NLP and 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 I mean try to think about data quality index from there. And I think the things that we want to cover is uh, one is like how do you how do you augment your data and check uh, that your data augmentation is happening correctly, and what are the data quality indexes that you can look for in NLP. And the other thing that we will look at is that how can you still work with uh, noisy labels. I mean, adversarial learning is one of the things that I will not both go into, but there are there are some 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 of the things in which you can actually like figure out what are your noisy labels and try to correct for them. Uh, so I think the I mean the bias problem in AI is very popular and people probably be well aware of that. That I mean usually like it comes in in bias in terms of gender or some race. For example, here people are saying that the client should receive his invoice in two weeks and Usually, like it should be both his or her. I mean, to be gender neutral, uh, and uh, there can be also things about you know things which are uh, which which you know relates to particular race or particular uh, or type of people, and the machine can learn that as as uh, bias. So, uh, uh, so basically, like. Uh, you can see how this this kind of you know uh, that researchers found that seventy percent uh, possible like even hidden bias related towards you know African Americans. And these are like uh, popular bias scenarios because uh, the data is kind of biased and hence the model and the bias gets magnified in the model. So, uh, but how can we look for bias, right? So we have all all these problems. I think this is a nice uh, link uh, where you can go and check uh, whether uh, your job description are biased or not. Uh, so you can try this. Uh, so uh, so the question is like that. Yeah, data will have bias. Uh, how do we how do we check that bias and how do we kind of figure that out? Uh, that would require something which is called uh, data quality index. Uh, so first of all, data quality we are discussing is very contextual. Uh, it will depend on the type of the data, what data you are dealing with. Uh, and you also might need what is called uh, benchmark data to kind of evaluate any data set or to set your uh, data quality index. So DQI is basically uh, what we call as data quality index. But uh, since like data quality is very contextual, uh, creating a data quality index has people have tried creating it and have they, they have done it. Uh, very you know the very application specific indexes they have created, but the question is that can we actually create a universal one? And I think there's one paper which talks about it, but uh, I didn't find that very generic. But still, like we can, I mean, it might be able to uh, spark some ideas. Uh, so uh, I actually found it to be good in terms of uh, in terms of like thinking about the problem at least. So, uh, what are some of the problems? I think uh, in in natural language processing, the problems are you know you have inference, uh, you might uh, go for argument mining, uh, question answering, uh, reading comprehension, or and uh, the, the, the more uh, complex problem is summarization or abs abstractive summarization. So these are kind of tasks that we usually deal with, uh, and so based on this, like if you look at our data sets. What are the data quality index that we can uh, we can kind of look for? So uh, the first thing that usually we check is looking at vocabulary magnitude. So voc vocabulary magnitude is that what is the distinct vocabulary set you have? Usually having a diverse set of vocabulary helps uh, because uh, then then you are learning a lot of new and, and basically like you have more coverage. So the more more data you collect, the same reason why. GPT three uh, works better than GPT two, or or GPT two works better than GPT one, is because uh, GPT two has much larger uh, training data and hence have larger uh, vocabulary magnitude. And uh, and we should also look for you know vocabulary across all post tags. It should not be that uh, that you are so you are increasing your vocabulary size, but it's not across. Uh, different uh, nouns or different like uh, distinct entities. The other, the, so these are two I think sources of bias that usually sets in, in in the in the data. One is like if you have a smaller size vocabulary or if you have a larger size vocabulary, uh, 
the model might learn some occurrences or, or some correlation with that, or even like with, with post tags. Uh, so uh, one, one good way to check that is kind of looking at language perturbation. So you can take sentences and you can part of those sentences. For example, like you can take a sentence and impute it with synonyms and see whether your model output drastically changes. And that can be a source of saying that, yeah, I have model, uh, some, some amount of bias in my data. And, and the other source of, I think this is something which uh, I also saw in the HACCP, uh, basically like you have domain specific vocabulary. For example, hate is one of the domain where if you look at the entire text uh, corpuses that we have, those does, doesn't have a lot of uh, hate related words. But when you try to go and detect hate speech, because those words are not very well represented in your generic corpus, uh, the model might tend to kind of just ignore them. So uh, presence of do domain specific vocabulary is a good sign for your data because uh, it will help you to learn better, better correlation for that particular domain. But we need to kind of see whether, whether the models are at all looking at the domain specific vocabulary for learning. Uh, for example, for hate speech duration, you can look at whether the model is focusing on uh, the hate related speech or it's focusing on something <laughs> else. Uh, the other thing that uh, we can look at is maybe you know maximal word distance or replacing post text. So basically, like I think this these are a popular technique uh, uh, that is like you, you take a post post tag and you replace the same word with a random word of a different post tag also of the same post tag. So basically, like if you have a noun, you take a random noun and replace that and see whether the model output changes a lot based on based on that. The other thing that uh, is important is that this consecutive verbs. Yeah, so if if you look at any any tra machine translation system, they will drop consecutive verbs. So presence of consecutive verbs is another uh, source of bias in the data. Uh, the other thing that you can see is that you can you can look you can remove entities and see whether your model changes the model output changes. So an anonymizing of entities, I think, uh, uh, yeah. I think this is done a lot in uh, in industry as well. For example, like. Uh, if you are training uh, your your on, on some financial uh, you know data, you might want to read uh, basically remove all the names and uh, uh, mention of any companies, making it more generic, and seeing how much the model is dependent on those entities and how much is dependent on the context. Basically, uh, you can also look for uh, things like uh, parser speech, uh, which is basically metonym, uh, and and then uh, stereotypes. So stereotypes basically you look at dependence on your model in any type of stereotypes like gender race and see uh, what is what is the you know so basically like how what is the distribution of those gender and race in terms of these engrams uh, the other important thing i think we were talking about is that are these out of distributions uh, for for a lot of cases like you might get age age and this kind of things in your data which are out of the range that is already seen by the data so if you see that birds and all these things uh, uh, they don't respond very well to this out of distribution. Uh, if you give like age equal to 100, probably it will not uh, correlate well uh, uh, in, in a textual pattern. So uh, this can be some ways to probe your data basically. These are not like something which you can use as index, but uh, the thing is that you can use things from uh, creating an index based on this. Uh, so the other things that uh, usually like is important is sentence length is one of the thing. How many start tokens you have? If you if you keep on giving, so if you have shorter sentences uh, to kind of pad, you will add a lot of start tokens, a lot of you know, special tokens, and and the model can just learn uh, undue like biases from them. Uh, usually, like the sentence structure is also very important. Uh, the the dependency structure of the sentence you can you can write basically natural language being so uh, noisy i mean you can write the same thing in, in multiple different ways so your model can be biased to certain sentence structure for example i mean it's a common thing like if you use normal news data versus twitter data your model might not well allow you to twitter because twitter might have very different sentence structure than uh, than you know normal news uh Again, like bird and all these things uh, doesn't doesn't work very well in multi-step reasoning. So that is another uh, another way that I mean, for example, you can you can imply that a if a is equal to b, then it implies c, 
and you can see whether your model basically understand them because that that is a good way to understand whether your model has contextual understanding or it is it is heavily dependent on those kind of vocabulary. Uh, usually, we see sentence and variation a lot because uh, uh, problem whenever we go from queries, queries are usually short text, and then if you go to something like add description, it is a long text, and usually the model won't perform very well. And if you if you use GPT three, you will see that. Uh, GPT three actually has a lot of issues when when uh, when you give very lo long context. So because it's a zero shot framework, uh, if you give a very large context, GPT three will uh, not be able to incorporate the entire entire context and start giving random things. Uh, so you can you can also try you know sentence perturbation. For example, like uh, take the sentence, uh, negate it, and do something something to the sentence and see whether your model uh changes a lot because uh if, if something so in nli if you look at that you have a you have a you know premise and then uh, either it is like a negation uh, or it is like aligning to it or it's a neutral i mean whatever it is so if you just negate that uh you know your uh, paragraph and you see it should become negation if it was like entitlement uh, in, in the beginning right so th that will actually help you to understand and i think the more uh, more things uh, this is like more about like within the sentence what kind of relationship you should have that means uh, the other thing is like within the samples like if you look at a particular sentence what kind of uh, biases that can creep in i think one is like code reference resolution is one of them because if you are not being able to uh, resolve resolve them uh, obviously your model might have some biases uh, for example like uh, even uh, so yeah i mean for example like if you have her uh, versus his, I mean, maybe like uh, he will not be able to probably you know correlate because he is represented more in the data. So if you are not able to do resolve coreference, that is one problem. Uh, the other thing is like you know kind of taxonomy trees and and this uh, presupposition and uh, and query are kind of similar in nature. It's basically like uh, sometimes like you say that okay you know uh, maybe you know bird and uh, you know uh, you know say suppose you can say that peacock and zebra zebra both are belonging to animals uh, and the model basically learns it uh, from there but then it can't differentiate the two because uh, i mean uh, peacock is a bird and uh, and uh, zebra might be you know some uh, animal then it can't differentiate between those two things uh, because your taxonomy in your uh, in your input distribution is is very different from from the output that you're expecting that can be one source of bias so uh, I think the the other things are like bias can also come from annotators or uh, the the variations of, of the split. Like if you if you take a split, which so for example, like one thing that we see is that if you take a if you train if your training data is like temporal in nature, like you have trained on some historical queries, trying to predict on the newer queries, you'll get this variational split effect because some of the things will not be in your training data and and probably need to kind of sample for them. Usually we see this for tail queries a lot. And uh, then there can be you know lots of other things. For example, like uh, there can be disagreement, uh, there can be random labeling. So one of the interesting thing about random labeling is that you can actually take any any problem, you can randomly flip the labels, and you can still try to learn the problem. And you see that the model will probably perform very well on the random labeling as well. Uh, but but there is no kind of relationship with the data there. So the question is that uh, the model can perform very well on the training set, but your generalization error will be very high. In ran random labeling, um, the other key things are maybe you know how do you perform, uh, how do you evaluate it, human performance uh, or against human performance, uh, kind of exposure bias or you know annotation like what kind of annotations are you using? Uh, those can also lead to kind of biases. So uh, I mean, how do you, so these are difficult things to counter into the, into the data quality uh, because there are a lot of subjectivity, a lot of uh, contextual. Uh, you know, information in this kind of things where you, what kind of annotation you're using or what kind of bias can be there. But uh, we we might want to like explore them uh, as possible sources of uh, data quality issues uh, and and track them. But I think yeah, I mean uh, these are some of the things that uh, I find found interesting. Like in this. so uh, so another thing is like uh, if you have uh, semantic uh, you know uh, text like within the sample, for example, like. Uh, within the sentence, uh, you, you can look at how much. So suppose like you have two couple of sentences, you can you can see see how. So 
in, in, in this NLI context, if you have a lot of overlap between your, uh, maybe like you, you are predicting something as entitlement because there's a lot of overlap in the vocabulary and you're not, when there's not an overlap, but they are of similar meaning. And hence, there's, so basically like, uh, again, the model should not say that whenever uh, whenever the sentences are similar, then only, you know, a premise can be, uh, you know, same as uh, entitlement or same as, uh, you know, negation. So sentence similarity, so people, you know, model can also learn sentence similarity based biases. And uh, yeah, and, and then there are like whole sorts of engram based uh, problems that can happen. For example, like some of the engrams can be very, very highly, you know, very, very skewed skew distribution of engrams across different classes. Uh, there can be, you know, grammatical errors and, and there can be, you know, gen you know, so some of the genders might be, uh, there might be gender distribution difference across labels, uh, not only across samples, but across labels. Uh, so when, it's, when I talked about that gender uh, distribution across samples, it's more about that for some of the sentence you have is more associated with certain genders, but it can also be the case that some of the labels are associated more with some genders. And then there can be you know, uh, different hyponym and hyponyms uh, distribution changes across different labels. So all this can be potential data quality index, uh, like a uh, potential source of creating a data quality index for NLP. Uh, so uh, I'll try to go to uh, data augmentation quickly uh, and then come, I, I have not answered the question that how can you create a universal data quality index? But uh, so let's, I mean, I, I hope like most of you like know what is augmentation. So basically like, suppose like if you have certain data sets, uh, what you can do is that you can, you can take a data and you can do some manipulation to the data, which doesn't change the inherent features of the data, but add some sense of noise or variable to it. And that can, you know, uh, work as a source of creating more diverse data for you. So, uh, so basically, like if you have cats images, you can actually like take. Uh, I don't know why the slides are all messed up. Maybe uh, some system issues. But yeah, uh, basically, like you can take the original one, and then you can uh, you can basically like uh, create uh, different kind of saturation or change the color temperature or add some filters. So these are usually like, or you can like also do this kind of rotation. Uh, so this is, this, this is kind of what we use in images, but the, these are not the same things as we use in, uh, in, in, in text. So text, you can try something like back translation where you have a English sentence, you translate it to French and then you translate back into English. And then you can that use the translated sentence from French to English as, as augmentation. So this, probably some of the techniques that you can try. Uh, so this is called back translation. Then you can replace synonyms. Uh, so for example, uh, so you can change techniques uh, with methods or article with write-up. Uh, so you can you can do random like insertion of, uh, you know, words uh, uh, to kind of, or I think it can be noise words as well, or some uh, meaningful words. You can swap, uh, you, can, you can swap this. So these are all generating, uh data which doesn't change the property of the samples too much uh, for a given problem for example this this swapping might not work very well in, in your machine translation because it is changing the structure of your uh you know the word ordering but it might have work very well in information retrieval scenarios uh yeah you can also delete things uh I mean, so they're all like techniques with which you can generate more data basically you are you're just changing the data slightly uh and and, uh, and then you are saying that that's that's a new sample just adding a set of va variance to your data uh so another another interesting thing is that you can just so, so if, if you're dealing with a sequence prediction problem where you have certain like people have queried and in, in, in a session they have queried query one query two you can also shuffle it and also train it as a new sequence usually the idea is that all the queries in the sequence are somehow related, so you can you can shuffle it. So uh, the thing that that is kind of uh, so the other thing is that this library, I think uh, this NLP org, you can try that, uh, which basically can do all these things. Plus you can also add the glove or what to make or you know Bert or this kind of word based contextual embedding. So you can find similar uh, words uh, based on glove word to make, or you can find uh, you know generate sentence from Bert or Robert itself. Uh, or you can get you know oh, similar words from word provider and try to augment your data. Uh, but the essential point that 
is not mentioned in this kind of augmentation is what assumption you are making so for example like as i said that in, in 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 this 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 kind of augmentation you can only do when uh, sentences in the same in the same sessions are like similar but it, it might not be always the case because uh, people usually define their searches as, as they go along so changing the sequence might might create problems so you are making some assumptions here so it is very important that when you do this augmentation you kind of vet your assumptions before you do kind of go and augment your data uh, but I, I have not come across very good techniques in which you can you can evaluate how good is, a, is your augmentation basically like this debate is always there that if you have a base data set and you're augmenting based on that uh, how much difference your augmentation should be from your base data set and that is usually not known because uh, if you if you want something very identical, then your variance will go away. Whatever variance you're trying to introduce, that will go away. Uh, but again, like if you make it too different, it, it might be something else at all, all, all together, right? For example, like there are a lot of research which talks about using this kind of generative model like GPT-3 to, to generate data for you or generate labels for you. The question is that how do you evaluate those labels? Uh, because or how do you use those text, augmented text, to kind of uh, to see what is the quality of the problem. They, they might be you now very not very good. And in my we don't need to because all that matters is the downstream task, right? So if the augmented data, although it's noisy, it helps in the main primary task. Yeah, yeah. So the model. that's what it should be. Yeah. So basically, like for example, this hate hate detection, right? So suppose like you are you, you or you can even take the example of depression detection. I can say that I will generate post which are so suppose like the in that case my the number of posts for depressed class is much less mm -hmm. so i want to augment the data yeah. so i want to generate post which looks like depressed yeah. data right yeah. using gpt3 now the problem is that if you look at the whole corpus on gpt3 is trained on uh, the probability of generating those kind of sentences might be low right so it might be generating something which is so the, the it, it will probably generate something which is very generic and now that augmentation will actually not help not even that and and, and that, that's true like we, we uh, whatever examples I and mean, whatever we have experimented uh, in, in, uh like in my uh, you know uh in the industry we have not found that to be very good can you combine gpt with some room based approach yeah so you can even uh, you can uh, or you can say that i'll have a i'll have something which which will evaluate like how close it is but still like Again, like that is dependent on how good that evaluation model is, mm -hmm. right? So whenever you're going to very eccentric kind of region where your data is not very well represented, this kind of problem kind of creeps in. Uh, so, so I think yeah. So uh, so yeah. I think what are the assumptions that you're making is something which is very very important. Uh, for, I mean, for generating synthetic data, and uh, what kind of checks you are making because <laughs> this is. So I think uh, one thing that is uh, suggested by a lot of papers is that maybe you can you can down down weight these new samples the synthetic samples because those samples are not you're not very confident on so you want to make the model no you're not very confident on so don't try to overfit on them and uh, then actually like the improvement might be there because uh, if you treat them same as your original data mm. it won't be problematic and what might be a good way of down so you can try just you know uh, some empirical like just some uh, simple ways of like making it lesser weight. Maybe you can give half the weight to it for all the. Just like I'm thinking about neural network, right? So there is no weight associated with input. No, but samples, right? So you can say that in the loss, whenever you're creating the loss, you need to write your customized compound. Yeah. So basically, you're saying that okay, don't don't really try to overfit on this synthetic data because it might be noisy, and then try to uh, yeah address that. Downweight them? No, I, I no 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 that that is not there. I mean, there's no the like like whatever you do like in, in in kind of class imbalance, you also don't have a structured way. So here also so basically it's a higher structure. I have not come across. Yeah. Actually, the people actually have gone very, very deep into generating augmenting data, but evaluation of augmenting data is still like open problem. Like I have not seen like people really 
uh, investigating how to evaluate augmented data. Because one problem is that we want it to be different. So you really can't uh, really can't say that they should be same. So what 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 should you like? What should be your reference that is not known? Uh, that is basically the problem. I mean, it's a well accepted fact that it is uh, it is not really uh, well well like uh, it's still like an open problem. A lot of people and and it's true for any generative model, right? So I mean, we are seeing a lot of chat GPT good examples, and maybe it's selection bias, right? People are just coming up with good examples, but I mean that happened for GPT three as well. But uh, I think uh, I mean over like I, I, I worked for like more than five months on GPT three, and, and it's just like and it sometimes <laughs> see, yeah, we have we have a lot of scope in NLP. Basically, the con that is a condition you draw. <laughs> so uh, so uh, so basically like uh, so yeah. So I think some of the vocab data quality index that you can try. So this from this from this paper, which. Try to propose a universal data quality index, but the, I don't agree with all of their formulations, so I have not really tried to present them here. But you can go through this paper and try to. So, so suppose like you can, you can keep some constraint on the vocab, saying that uh, my what is my vocab size, what is my you know the the number of so what is the number of uh, representation. So we should have minimum. So this is a well known thing that in 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 we keep we we kind of remove words which are. Either overrepresented, for example, stop words or words which are very underrepresented as outliers. So uh, you, you should keep check on those things uh, while you are, because sometimes when you are using transformer, we are not even doing all those uh, basic things. Uh, then I think you can you can also look at uh, what is the in like if you have different n grams, what, what is the relation within the data set? For example, like how 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 are the you know what, what are the you know percentage of you know data is nouns and how how do they relate with the pronouns and all these things? So basically, like those are some of the things you can look at. Uh, so the other other thing that you might want to look at is that if you have a sentence, then are there similar sentences to that? Because otherwise, that would be a very you know odd odd sentence if you don't have any sentence. And try to, trying to kind of get more data around that. Uh, and within the same sample, you might not have words which are very similar in meaning because that will uh, give you bias. Uh, you can look at n gram per label, saying that whether some labels some labels have higher there will be some higher proportion of n gram, but the variance should not be too high. Uh, you should also look at like word similarity within the sample, saying that in the same sentence there should not be words of very high similarity. Then it will basically bias the data. Uh, and then you can also look at uh, your sentence similarity, basically semantic uh, text similarity between different uh, split of your data. Uh, you can look at, at gender or in different categories, and you can you can try to look at it. So uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think before going to this, I think I I wanted to just uh, go over. Yeah, I think this is a Kaggle problem on this uh, toxic text classification. So I just wanted to like show like there might be so. So basically, like you, I mean, I just took it from Kaggle. So this notebook, I edited it on Kaggle. So so basically, like you, what you have is that you have text, and then there is uh, whether it's toxic, uh, severe toxic, uh, obscene, or threat insult, or an identity related head. So uh, I would encourage people to kind of look at the. ED of this data to, to if you want to understand what bias data looks like, there's a lot of bias data because uh, you will see that a lot of identity uh, hate will be related to some genders. Uh, some of the toxicity will be related to certain specific genders. Uh, threats uh, or obscenity might be related to some some uh, like race or gender and this kind of thing. Right? So this kind of correlation you might find. Uh, so uh, and it, it might be some it's, it's ex explicit data. So uh, that that is one one kind of uh, yeah so one kind of uh, warning uh, if you want to go and work with this data but so uh, there are two kind of things that I tried uh, here one is using a synonym based augmentation that means it will take from word name synonyms and just augment the data and uh, I, I was trying to like make the toxic uh, the basically the toxic class more balanced. Wherever there is a toxic comment, uh, you just try to balance it out by generating, um, adding augmented data. And I think one thing that I have 
uh, found uh, is interesting. So I think I'm going to run this data set, but uh, let me try to run this. Some of the libraries got Yeah, actually what I wanted to show is kind of erased, uh, but let me try to present the concept at least. So instead of like measuring all the DQI, I think one good way to measure this is when you are generating the data from this NLP org, what you can do, you can run an LD on top of it. And LD might be a good way to measure this in an unsupervised way. Basically, like you can take your original text and you can take your uh, uh, like your take your augmented text. And now if you run an LDA, you will be able to inspect what, how your clusters are shifting. And maybe you can look at the top 10 topics and see what is the word distribution. And if they look very different, then you can take a subjective call based on what you want, whether your augmentation is successful or not successful. So ideally, like my hypothesis is that uh, the LDA should not change a lot. Your latent distribution should not change a lot. Whereas your vocabulary might change because what you're saying is that your your so basically like if you go by the LDA concept, right? So what you're saying is that your document word representation should not change a lot. If that is changing, then probably your augmentation is too too harsh or too too kind of, uh, um, yeah, too, too kind of, it's kind of really making things, uh, probably can make things difficult for you. So, uh, so probably like looking at LD is one of the ways to uh, evaluate your, uh, uh, your uh, augmentation procedure, I mean, for NLP at least. But again, like the question still remains that how much scale divergence you want to look for, or uh, what kind of uh, what kind of changes you want per topic, or how much change you want, or how, what is the attribution for each topic word or for each uh, word document probabilities. That is not very clear. So uh, probably that you can you know can explore for your problem. So uh, unfortunately, like this will take a long time to run, uh, but I can share this notebook with everyone. Uh, yeah, I think I, I want to take up the rest of the time to kind of talk about. Uh, so if you do that augmentation, then how much improvement do you get in your range? 
So uh, in this case, I think uh, using that similarity, someone some people got two or three percent improvement. But I have not tried the bird based one. I have to see check. But again, like if you're getting too much improvement from the augmentation, I, I think the data itself is a problem. Because ideally you should not get so much improvement by just doing augmentation. I mean, you can, so, I mean, the idea should be that you should be, so your, your accuracy should not be improved using augmentation, but your mm -hmm. overfitting should reduce, right? That means that you can still perform bad in your test, but it should, but your training error and the test error should come closer. That is what you want from your augmentation. But you were saying the overfitting will reduce, but then... It goes somewhat, it goes against the principle of overfitting mm -hmm. because we're adding more data, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you keep on adding data instances, it, the model tends to overfit on your data, isn't it? Yeah, if, if you're adding more samples, uh, then, then yeah, then basically you're, you're creating overfitting. So, it, it could be overfitted towards those augmented examples, right? Mm -hmm. So, that's why, like, so you need to like something that you don't want, you shouldn't want. That's why you have these weights. Yeah. Less, less weights for those. Right. So I think the label inconsistency is another problem that basically like usually like we, we have this concept of gold stand, standard data, but the idea is that is gold standard really, you know, gold. Uh, so, and, and human editors, uh, having human editors always doesn't mean good level because this is something which we have repeatedly seen uh, even even subject matter experts can make errors uh, because of a lot of biases and sometimes it can be con cognitive load because uh, if you are if you are like if people are like labeling 10000 samples a day you, you would expect that some 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 of them will kind of might be random just uh, and also like a lot of people have proposed that you can generate uh, automatic automatic labelings I think this letter is running out of This, I think this one. Because mining is full. So the question should be that, can we learn from noisy label data, right? I mean, data which is noisy level, can we still learn from? So, uh, the, I mean, so, I mean, we can look at why labeling errors occurs. I mean, it can, it can occur, so, you know, occur because of different reasons. Uh, so usually like in, 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 in uh, search, we see that when people have is satisfied with the search, they kind of stop, stop there. That doesn't mean that, some of the results are bad because if you look at the document, some of the documents are still relevant, but just went and, and clicked on the document and they never came back, right? So that doesn't mean the rest of them are not, not uh, you know, bad. So that is a kind of a one source of uh, bad levels. Uh, and uh, then, then people have, you know, overconfidence or underconfidence on certain levels. So suppose like you don't know something, you might, instead of like giving it as ambiguous, you might, because you don't have an option, you might give it as, you know, a negative level or a positive level, uh, right? So if something is like, you know, occurring a lot, then, then, and th those kind of things, like you, you tend to like label, uh, kind of, uh, so, so for example, like, for, so you are trying to go with that inertia that suppose like you are labeling most of the things are as a non-cancer, then probably if you have any doubt, you will kind of go with the non-cancer, uh, then we have you know confirmation bias it can happen that uh, right so uh, and, and then there's this Campbell fa fallacy right uh, if you have you know similar uh, you know patterns uh, similar like cases happening then you can say that that there'll be some pattern so suppose like you have you for so the last five sentences you have labeled as a positive sample now our next sentence comes is slightly different 
you might think that it's, it's something different and, and kind of uh, give a different level uh, to kind of break the pattern. So I think this, this is what I was pointing at that if you have a data set and, and you you this you know plotted by the descending uh, laws that you're getting getting in the model, probably you will get you know some insights. And uh, there's a concept of confident learning that uh, that was uh, uh, published in NeurIPS, which I think is very interesting in terms of how do you filter and and they have actually a uh, actually like a library in python with which you can try out uh so so the idea here is interesting is that suppose you have a model uh, which is a good model suppose you you have a model like a neural network based model which can generalize pretty well and uh suppose what you're doing is that uh and, and you're assuming that your labels that you have that means this y tilde these are your noisy labels so the labels that you have but you don't trust this label. So now, uh, and, and if it's a multi-class classification problem, then you want to build a con uh, confusion matrix. Basically, this C is a confusion matrix. So in our general confusion matrix, what we do is that we uh, we try to count uh, the number of, uh, you know, uh, so true versus the predicted labels. So we have uh, true versus predicted labels count in our confusion matrix. But here, the, the confusion matrix will be uh, based on that, what are your uh, what are what are the noisy labels and what are the true labels? And you don't know the true labels, so you'll estimate the true labels basically. Uh, so, so this can only be done in one case. Only the the assumption here is that the labeling error has occurred because of the class. That means it is condition on the class and not condition on the data. Uh, I mean, a simple example to that would be that if you look at uh, any any image coco like related data, you will see that if you have if you have a, a image related to missile, the probability of being uh, of that being labeled as a projectile uh, or uh, or mislabeled as a projectile is much more than any random class. So that is the problem. Basically, like the labeling error occurs mostly when things are similar and people are con confusing them, uh, or, or or in general that, that that class is still confusing. So these are the two scenarios that can happen. Uh, but it is not based on the data. Basically, you, you don't change the data or there's no problem with the data that you assume. So it's basically class conditional. It is depending on your true labels, uh, you're, you're, you're making the error. So, uh, so what you're trying to do is that you're trying, you have a model which is trained on the noisy label. Now using that, so if you input that your feature X to that model, you'll get a probability which is P, uh, P hat, which is basically your estimated probability. And now you derive a threshold, which is TJ. For every class, you derive a threshold. Uh, and this threshold is that what is your average prediction or, or pro, pro, you know probability for this class? So if you have this uh, class, for what what is the average probability? Now, basically, given any prediction, you look at if if your prediction for that class exceeds that threshold, and if it does, then you can consider that uh, that as a that 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 has a probability that uh, the actual class was actually J and not. I, which is which, which, and hence I is a noisy class, and but it actually belongs to J. So basically, you'll you'll say that whenever a model uh, exceed the this threshold for a particular class, I will I will probably count that as as a labeling error. Uh, so uh, so this is basically the setup of confident uh, learning, and uh, the interesting thing is is this threshold because. You can tweak this threshold. You can actually keep this threshold as something like a 99 percentile. That means saying that if if the probability for that class is exceeding the the average prediction of that class by 99 in the 99 percent, that means it is like very very confident that it is belonging to that class. I will count that as a labeling error uh, for this i j. So i was your label that is given in the data, which you are considering as a noisy label, and j is basically based on the model. And uh, now you can create this confusion matrix just by counting. Basically, like whenever uh, these off diagonals are are one, that means like you have a noisy label. When the diagonals are one, that means you have good labels. And based on how many uh, you know elements you have in the diagonal and versus the off diagonal, you can easily create uh, probabilities. So what you you are going to do is that you are going to create probabilities that given a particular noisy label what is the probability of getting a true label so you can create this kind of transition probabilities 
And uh, so suppose there's a class for which there's a lot of samples which are in the off diagonal. That means that class is really noisy and you can actually like down sample the, uh, the examples of those class or you can actually go and relabel those classes. Uh, and it, for classes, you are very confident in terms of their, uh, their labels. That means a lot of things are in the diagonal. That means for that class, only uh, the prediction for the, the probability prediction for that class is exceeding the threshold. And for no other class is not exceeding the threshold. Then for those classes, you, you can really upweight the samples. And that way you, you will be, you know, cleaning your data to some extent by removing noisy samples. So these, these are interesting framework, uh, but it doesn't really work in all the cases. Uh, it works very well in IMDb data. So I was trying with uh, Reddit uh, comment uh, uh, sentiment classification data. Uh, and I found it to be not really working. But the interesting thing, the thing is that it, it sometimes points out things which are, so in sentiment analysis, we, we figure out samples which are neutral and still labeled as positive or negative. Uh, we, we can actually mine some of those samples. So that that's something very interesting. So. So these kind of stuff, the results that they got. So in, in MNIST, they found, uh, you know, uh, incorrected uh, this nine, you know, so this nine given as eight. Uh, and and there, there are a lot of like other data sets where they kind of uh, found discrepancies. And basically like the interesting thing is that uh, they took this, uh, I think this is from ImageNet, uh, if I'm not wrong. But in, in the right-hand side, if you see that uh, they took the noisiest class, which is Fox Sound, and they, uh, they use this uh, confident dynamic to remove some of the data from the training and seeing that there's a there's actual lift uh, in the in the accuracy. Uh, and uh, similarly, like you can uh, see that uh, if you look look at known uh, you know erroneous uh, you know class like uh, Mallot, so you will see that there's a lot of uh, improvement just by using this kind of a framework where you are just basically you are down sampling some of the samples or you are removing some of the samples because they are more likely to be called some some other sample or some other class, uh, right? And and that that's basically like uh, the this framework. So uh, let me try to go. I think this uh this uh example where you can. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking a uh, uh, Reddit basically data so so I'm, I'm taking a reddit sentiment data so uh, and uh, it has it has three kind of categories uh, basically it has uh, class zero which means neutral sentiment class one means positive and class two means negative sentiment and uh, then uh, what i'm doing is that i'm just cleaning this data up and passing it through a simple uh, neural net uh, so i'm cleaning this data up and passing it through some uh, neural net uh, so uh, what what I see is that so like this is just cleaning the data. Let's go to the part of the neural net. Um, so yeah, so this is where I I trained a simple uh, classification model. So I just use a simple uh, uh, like this uh, embedding based model, and uh, and then like once I trained it, uh, it it's like this is the encoding basically. And I'll be getting some uh, category accuracy of uh, like, so there's a lot of variability in the data. Some of the epochs are not that great. Uh, so uh, once I uh, once I predict it, so so what I can do is that I can I can call this framework called uh, this uh, clean labels, uh, this clean lab. This is a, basically a startup I think by MIT, which is working on this. And uh, so basically, if you give this predicted probabilities to this, uh, uh, what you will do, you will rank the labels based on this predicted probabilities. And uh, so there are different kinds of ways you can you can either rank it, you can fill in it, uh, different ways of cleaning this label up. So it kind of gives some examples, and you can look at some of the examples. Uh, so it is saying that everyone knows the limitation, like imitation, the sincerest from uh, form of that right? So it, it is talking about that, and it is giving a negative label for this, which is which is bad. It's not it is it's not like like a negative uh, label. So it has like found this kind of a label where there's an inconsistency, but it is not like accurate all the times. So there are uh, you know things which has like slurred words, but it is it is uh, giving that as like this this is a positive label, which is which is bad. 
because there's a lot of, you know, slur word here. Uh, so uh, this, this is an example where probably it got confused with the large sentence size. Uh, and uh, it, it is a negative sample, uh, but it, it, and it's, it's a correctly labeled sample, but it's still using it. It's not always perfectly figuring out what is bad level, but you can see some of the examples are, are, are really interesting in the sense that it can figure out this kind of discrepancies uh, where uh, where your labels are not aligning with your data. And you can use that basically. So you can use that to clean your data. So I tried cleaning up this Reddit data, but I didn't find an improvement on the accuracy. Uh, so the image, so actually dropped by 6% by cleaning the label label. So, but that, that might be also the reason that might be because of bias in your data that uh, model was capturing as spurious correlation. So, uh, but it, it's an interesting framework to basically uh, maybe, you know, get, uh, so it is basically saying that there's, it is failed to improve the model accuracy over the actual accuracy that we got with the original data. Set. So uh, I think that, that is this one framework, which I found uh, quite interesting from the data point of view, like it actually forces you in, in contrast to, uh, in contrast to something like, you know, uh, uh, something like where you are doing adversarial training. This is actually like making you look at the data and seeing that, okay, what is going wrong? And let me fix that. Uh, or let me try to, you know, counter, at least like remove that. So that is, I think, uh, something interesting. Uh, I think uh, this is probably the last slide. So you know that you're comparing uh, with prediction. That model that you're using is the final epoch model or some? Yeah, the final epoch model. Like, uh, no, it's not a base. Kind of it's not a waste one. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a simple data, so I didn't uh, do all this stuff. But yeah, you can always do those things and get better. better. Yeah, I think uh, the takeaways are basically like so it should be both model centric and data centric. Maybe we'll have a feature centric as well next year. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, yeah, I think the idea is to like. We should focus on you know debugging and curating the data, not only the model, and uh, creating metrics for data quality as well uh, instead of only like model model quality, uh, and uh, and development of this automated label or data you know data augmentation. How to create uh, you know evaluation for that is kind of a active area. So any any ideas you know are welcome. Uh, so yeah, that 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 is kind of the thing that I wanted to kind of cover. Uh, yeah, questions. You have talked about uh, replacing the words period synonyms now. So I think there is just for a data set, uh, it has two class and the data distribution is like 80 into two. So can we apply that thing to Yeah, you can apply any augmentation. And do you think it will increase the model? <laughs> that you have to test. So data augmentation doesn't guarantee model improvement. Right? So uh, I think what they were was saying is that I didn't like your increase in the variance. So you probably overfit. Uh, so right. So that, I mean, so for label imbalance, data augmentation might not be always a solution. Because to solve label, uh, if you have data imbalance problem, you can either solve by getting, uh, like constraining the loss function by focusing only on your less represented sample, right? So class weights. You can use class weights, right? So that is one way. Uh, so the other way is that you, you get more samples for your, so, so you, you can do simple, like you can do something like, you know, uh, over sampling of your less represented data. That means you're copying over the same thing. Right. Then you are going to overfit your model. For that class, yeah. Okay. For that class, you are going to do that. So that that right. that's why like you you add some amount of variability, but this is like more variability, right? So you are you you are adding more variability here. Now you have to kind of uh, see like how do you add the variability. Uh, so you can either probably use some, uh, yeah, I don't know, like maybe some generation, like some BART or this kind of base similarity might also help. Not only like synonyms. Synonyms are based on word names, so I don't know. Uh, 
So yeah, I think those, those things like is pretty much open. But even try and see. Yeah. Let's say we have got a purpose. It might happen that WordNet does not have the code. Just update the WordNet. I don't think you can. I don't know. I have never tried to do that. But I think it's a, it's a data structure, so you can, you can definitely do it. Yeah. That's so why I stop. So we end the session here. I think we need to disconnect from Zoom, right? Yeah. And the next talk is at four seven. Seven right? It is fully online. Fully online. Like it or something. I don't think in a party, maybe I talk.